Hi everyone, so I promised you a video about how to draft a critical review of a journal article and I am finally there. So as you start the week, uh, you'll have this as a guideline. Um, it's a fairly complicated exercise, so it's a, it's, it really is a, a threefold uh, sort of uh, objective. First, because you're going to go in, in depth into at least one of the readings in your course. Secondly, because you're going to be in an experiential way practicing uh, the critical review of a journal article and maybe learning how to do it. And thirdly, because then everyone in the course, in the form, is going to be able to read your review and therefore get another in-depth introduction to a reading that maybe they've not had time to do. Okay, so it's a sort of a triple effect. So I've given you some examples there of, uh, of different university sites that give you uh, sort of cues on how to write a critical review and sometimes even some samples. So feel free to um, to uh, access all of these. Um, I'm going to keep it simple. I think sometimes they get it confusing. You're going to see that certain uh, certain academic sort of one different things, different sections, it's a slight variation. I'm going to take it back down to the essence, the basics. Um, and the easiest way to get to the basics of a critical review is to go back to the basics of what you expect to be in a study. And so just as a refresher, this is really what we would expect to be in the structure of a study. The beginning can change slightly. You will sometimes have people who have different names for this, and sometimes it's in three parts, sometimes it's in one part. But really you have a generally a section that will cover the context of uh, why the researcher is studying what they're studying, introducing the, uh, the context, stating their research objectives, and then stating their research question. So this could be three parts, be four parts, generally is one. If I write a general article, I will only have one for these, but you will find these four items in the first part. The second part is the lit review, always. The third part is the theory. Now that's where it gets a little complicated because the theory should always be there, but sometimes part of it will be included in the lit review, as in the writer um, covers also the, the literature around that theory. And then it's covered in a methodology in a sense that the author sometimes explains that the theory has informed the choice of method methodology. So sometimes they include it in here. So it could be self-standing at this stage, or it could be split in two and in half in the lit review, half in the methodology. Then you would have a methodology section, which includes a choice of methodology, explaining why you've chosen it, uh, the process of data collection, and then the process of data analysis. Then you have the findings, and then you have the outcomes. Um, so these are the expe expected um, sort of um, process, and we're going to follow exactly the same thing when we're reviewing. So, and as you get more elegant and more at ease with it, you might be actually reshuffling the, 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 you know, keeping all this, but reshuffling the elements around so that your text flows. In your case, if it's your first one, if you're just learning to do this, there is nothing wrong with keeping the sort of checklist and actually going through this and actually reviewing the elements that you expect to be there one at a time. So let me show you what you're going to, how you're going to contextualize, how you're going to criticize that. Context, intro, objectives, and questions. You are going to um, obviously state what the objectives are and whether the question is clear, whether the question is well stated, and whether the objectives are clear. And then in the end, in the, when you review the outcomes, you're going to come back to this and see whether the objectives stated have actually been achieved, because that's how you can assess the, the, that part of the, uh, of the study. The lit review. This is something a graduate students find difficult, but reviewing a lit review, you're going to see whether it's wide enough, so nothing has been missed, there have been no blind spot, whether it's rich enough, so enough details given about the literature surrounding your study, and also whether it's up to date. So normally you would expect nothing to be older than 10 years, and that if it is, you could uh, negatively review the lit review. So you're going to explain generally what's in the lit review, but you're also mostly going to be assessing its quality, its richness, its, its the fact that it's up to date, and its scope. Um, theory. Theory is always a little difficult when you're graduate students, but you're trying to see what the theory is, and then you're going to see whether it's appropriate. You actually are going to have a fairly easy time because most of what you have in unit one and two is either critical theory or critical pedagogy. So you don't have far to go to see which one it is. And obviously it's appropriate because that's why you've chosen these articles because they all are situated within critical theory and critical pedagogy because it talks about oppression and marginalization. So you have an easy job on this one in this case because we've actually got a very small niche of articles and we know what the theories are. 
methodology that's going to be something which is very hands-on which i think is at your level should be feasible you're going to ex assess whether you think the methodology chosen is is, is appropriate you're going to look at the data pro collection process and see if there, any improvements could have been made or whether it impresses you and you are going to assess the data analysis process. So that's two different things. You could have collected the data very effectively with very good tools, but you could have done a really bad job at analyzing it. So you do have to, to, to give two um, sort of portions of your assessment of the methodology. Then you look at the findings. And again, what you could assess here, so we've gone down here, what you could assess here is whether the findings are clear, whether they are um, complete, whether they bring something to the field, whether they are worthwhile conclusion, whether it's actually been worthwhile doing this study. Um, so, you know, go well, but there's a lot to assess there. Does it have an impact on you? Does it have an impact on the field? Is this something that has really made a big change in the body of literature around oppression, marginalization, or, 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 or you know, critical pedagogy in the classroom? And then you get to the outcomes and the outcomes are fairly easy to uh, assess because usually the author actually states the limitations of the outcomes. So you see whether they are aware of the limitations and usually they also uh, should state themselves whether they've met their objectives. If they haven't, that's a good angle for assessment for you to see whether actually um, the outcomes sort of resemble or meet the expectations. So that's the body of your, of your, um, your critical view. Now you're gonna add, uh, two things. You are going to add um, the, the, the full APA citation of the article at the top. Why at the top, not at the bottom? Because you are not citing anything else. You're only citing one article. So it doesn't make any sense to have a bibliography. You would put it at the top. And what it happens when you put it at the top is that then it avoids you having to repeat it in the body of the text. You can go straight into saying the author, this article, the author, this article. It's a lot less heavy and you don't have to repeat the title in the uh, in the text itself. And the other thing which you're going to add, which is usual in a, um, in a critical theory, uh, in a, sorry, in a critical, um, critical analysis of a journal article, is you are supposed to assess language. Um, is it well-written? Is it not well-written? Is it accessible? Um, and does it use jargon, which it should not? Does it use lay person's vocabulary, which it should? Um, is it well-structured? Is it easy to get into? Um, is it easy to understand? you always assume that the reader actually knows nothing about what you're talking about. So is it written with that level of accessibility in mind? Um, and that could be a, in the middle, could be at the end, you really place that where you want. Now, on the next slides, I give you a few, a few tips. I've already said APA citation at the top. You can follow the same structure since you're learning how to do this. As I said, when you're later, when you have more uh, elegance and, and, and ease, you will, might want to reshuffle the parts as long as you touch on all of them, it doesn't matter in which order they are. You have to go beyond description. This is a mistake I often see in graduate students. They will describe what they see, but they don't actually assess what they see. So you can describe it, but you should also assess it. Um, oh, I, I forgot something. At the top, it is usual that you summarize the article because what you're doing is you, you're assessing it for someone who hasn't read it to tell them whether it's worthwhile reading it. So you're gonna summarize it very briefly so that they know what it's about before you actually analyze and tell them whether it's worth reading. It's not a long summary. It could be three or four sentences. It's really, really not long. Um, you should keep the tone positive and collegiate. Here we have quality articles. I don't think you're gonna be you know, um, criticizing anything negatively, but if you ever have to do this with something that you're very critical about, it's very important that you always keep the tone collegiate. Why? Because the double review process or simply the review process is a usual exercise in academia and you will review lots of people and lots of journal articles. Um, and usually you review them before they're published, right? So you're the reviewer for that. And it's always usual to stay positive and collegiate because you might one day, first of all, be reviewed by that person. So you don't want them to be as harsh as you be, but also because you are likely to meet them at a conference or in a job. And so you don't want to be that person that has really, um, you know, been overly uh, critical to them. You can say a fairly abrupt things, but you say them with very gentle language. That's usually, imagine the person sitting next to you and you're telling them this feedback, right? It's not a neutral, harsh sort of criticism. 
Um, it's usual that if something is not so great, you finish with a positive at the end. So that even if you have a negative review, you'll keep something positive at the end. It could be something like, you know, even if the article is not great, it had a great topic or it has the benefit of bringing something forward that needs further review, further, you know, research. You finish with something positive. Other tips, the first person is not acceptable in a critical review. It's a bit annoying because I understand you will say, but you are very present. You are reviewing. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of subjectivity in, involved. It is your reading, but normally in that exercise, there is no first person and no person plural. It's not we, it's not I. You're just, the author says this, this, this. You're assessing supposedly in a neutral tone, right? Um, at the end, you can give some a line or two that's more of your opinion, but still not in the first person. Uh, but you can sort of find a way of suggesting that it's a, that it's something that has impact for you or not, but you don't say you. Um, so you just finish with a sort of flourish sentence, uh, praising the values of it if you think that they need to be praised. And we can see that it's you there, but you're still not using the I, the, the first person. Choosing your article. Um, I let you choose any article in section one and two as long as they, f they are... Um, a study, a traditional study. What do I mean by a traditional study? A study that has a research question, collects data, and then carries out data analysis. Why? Because you're learning to do this and, and the model I've just given you is easier to do with traditional straightforward studies. Avoid book chapters, which you have a few of, I think, and avoid meta-analysis, which are these sweeping um, analysis of the data of other studies, right? I think I've spoken about it, but meta-analysis doesn't collect data from the field. It uses the data from other studies. So it will go through, you know, 10 years or 15 years of findings in other articles. And then it comes up with trends saying, you know, out of the 600 articles we saw, we saw that 400 were doing this, 200 were doing that. So it's still a journal, it's still a, a study. It still has methodology. But because it doesn't collect data, it becomes really, really difficult to uh, to analyze because you have to go into how well the methodology was set up. And that usually looking at how uh, the, the author has used um, search engines from libraries. And so I don't think you're quite ready for that. So avoid meta-analysis, avoid book chapters. But any other studies would work. Um, I, I People have been telling me that they're so anxious about choosing and they would rather I chose for them. So I'm going to try and go through and select four or five studies that you can... Um, you know, you can choose from if really you don't want to use that freedom, but you should because you have a lot of articles in the list that are just suggestive reading and it's a good occasion to go and explore them and, and, and do that thorough reading by doing the critical review. It's a tough exercise. It's an exercise that I always put in graduate courses because the expectation is that you learn to do this. I can already tell you that in 510, you will have to do this again. It's very usual to be in courses that you have to do a critical review. It's a very traditional exercise in graduate education because we're training you for the field because you have to do this uh, in, in the field. So it's tough, but you have to learn to do it. And this is the course where you're learning to do it. So I'm very happy to give you formative feedback and to, um, and to read your draft and give you some feedback before you submit, right? So take the opportunity and I'm happy to do that. Don't submit in the forum, send it to me as an email saying clearly in the title, I would like formative feedback. I'll read it. I won't go line by line, but I'll give some feedback. You can touch it some more and then you can submit it. So um, I look forward to reading you and I look forward to um, giving you formative feedback if you do require it. And I hope this has helped. So I will post that right away. We're on Monday the 13th, okay?